What has happened to the A&M offense? Is Alabama vulnerable this year? We're going to discuss all that and much, much more here on Up to the Second College Football Season 2, Episode 3. I'm David Nuno, and she is Kennedy Smith. Hello, Kennedy. Hey, David. This this was a crazy weekend we had of football. I mean, you saw some big upsets and a surprising game from UT and Alabama. What do you think's making Alabama vulnerable this year? Well, one of the things we talked about leading into the season was that I was – still wondering how good is this offensive line is you can't lose Evan Neal and replace him with Tyler Steen and expect to be better that being said I think they showed to be a little suspect against Texas I still want to see those wide receivers uh, see how they continue to grow Alabama's going to figure things out but I just don't know if they are not vulnerable there in the SEC West especially with the way Arkansas is playing yeah well what's our big matchup we're looking at this week oh uh, well it should have been a bigger matchup but it, it is Miami versus Texas A&M A&M loses that uh I want to say heartbreaker, but just a disheartening game against App State over the weekend. Miami, 2-0. They beat Southern Miss. I'm very interested to see how A&M bounces back after a bad loss. And Miami, are they the real deal here with the Canes? Are they really back? We may find out part of that here this weekend. Yeah, we've got some special guests on today, including Andre Ware, our very own Billy Lucci, and then some special insiders from Auburn, Georgia, and Miami. It's up to the second college football. All right, our next guest is our big guest of the week, Andre Ware. He's a Heisman Trophy winner. He's a legend in the Houston area. You name it, you see him all over ESPN broadcasting all the big games. Andre, welcome to the show, my man. Uh, thank you. Thank you, guys. How are you doing? We're good. We're good. So I, I guess we should probably start things off with the crazy week that it was in college football, Andre. Uh, what did you make of all these upsets? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think there's plenty of parity now that the 85 scholarship limit has kind of taken hold. It's been a few years now, and then you mix that with a transfer portal. And so you you start to get some uh, a level playing field among many, many conferences and teams within conferences. And so you have a team like App State that, sorry, Kennedy, I got to bring it up, but uh, they go to A&M and they went on the road. Uh, it's, it's amazing. And then Georgia Southern taking down Nebraska is another one that comes to mind. Uh, you just have some... Uh, this is, where it's it, it's a level playing field now among college football, and I think it's going to grow even closer as the years come. Andre, I can't blame you for bringing up the A&M loss. I think <laughs> anybody would. But uh, do you think A&M has a chance to really get their offense right? I think so. Uh, you got some moving parts, some new pieces there that uh, chemistry needs to take hold, and that, that takes a while. At the beginning of every season, the defenses are always ahead of the offenses because it's kind of line up and, and on the defensive side, line up and just go play. Offenses, there has to be chemistry. There has to be continuity, a new quarterback uh, at, uh, at A&M this year. And so it's going to take a little while for things to start to gel. But once they do, I think Jimbo has loaded the program with a lot of talent. It's an opportunity this week to bounce back against a good Miami team. So um, that, that's one that I'm, I'm definitely going to keep my eyes on this week. Andre, how legit do you think is Miami? Because they got the quarterback in Tyler Van Dyke. They've got the, uh, right. the new regime there. Uh, they should be on track, but I guess this will be their first real test. Yeah, with uh, Mario Cristobal, the, the new head coach, he seems to be no nonsense. They've taken away the turnover chain, so they can't have any fun at Miami. So they might as well win games in the process, so to speak. But uh, I, went, I ranted about that on my game last week about the turnover chain. I loved it, but I, I think that the program itself is set to make a turn. They're going to spend some money at Miami to update the facilities, which are long overdue. Uh, I think one, facilities are an attraction to recruits, and secondly, NIL. Uh, and it may be in reverse, NIL and then facilities. And, and how many uniform changes that you have are seem to be important to uh, to recruits nowadays. But I think Miami's got a chance to, to really uh, – really kind of recapture what they had years ago uh, when everybody keeps asking, is the U back? This may be the year. And they're going to see it this 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 weekend against a good Texas A&M team that's looking to bounce back. I saw a game a couple of, in preparation. Syracuse takes down Louisville two weeks ago. Then Louisville has a chance to right the ship against UCF, and they do on the road. So I, I look for the same thing for A&M this week with uh, – in a, in, a, in a nutshell, going to with Miami coming in, a and M riding the ship with a win over Miami. Yeah, speaking of Louisville, you're covering the Florida State Louisville game this week, and last week you actually covered that Louisville game also. So, what are your early thoughts on these two teams? 
Louisville, you know, you you don't know what you're going to get. They look like two totally different teams in, in the, the loss to Syracuse on the road. I think they took them a little lightly, thought that it was a Syracuse team that that uh, from years past, and it's not. They've got a good quarterback in Schrader, a good running back, and a, good, a solid defense. They've added some size and changed the look of things offensively. They're no longer running, trying to run 100 plays in a game. They've slowed it down a little bit with Coach Anai their new offensive coordinator. So uh, when you look at them, they can bounce back. They bounced back last week. Can they can they play well at home? I would expect them to do so. Florida State is is a is a toss up. They won a an easy first week's game last week against a tough, tough LSU team, or that last week they were off, but the previous week against a good LSU team, they were able to uh, to kind of settle in and, and become the Florida State that we expect them to be. They're in the same boat with Miami. Everybody's asking, when's Florida State going to come back? They've had four losing seasons in a row, uh, and uh, a couple of those are under Mike Norvell. So they, they, uh, they're looking to get things righted. They look the part. They look bigger on the offensive line, which has always been an Achilles heel the last couple of years. And defensively, they've, they've always been pretty good on that side of the ball. Andre, did you learn more about – Texas or Alabama this past weekend in that nail biter of a game? That's a great question. I, I think I learned more about Texas than I did Alabama. Uh, I, I think that dominance, the the uh, dynasty that is Alabama may be ready to take a hit because now they're being out recruited by Texas A&M. They're being out recruited by Georgia. Clemson's always in there. So the parody is, is catching up to Alabama, but I learned more about Texas and what Sark has done there, recruiting, uh, the coaching staff finally leveling itself out, and then playing hard. I, I re- fully expected Alabama to blast Texas in Austin, and it just didn't happen. So it tells me a lot about what what Texas is. They lose their starting quarterback in that game. They don't miss a beat. They're still competitive all the way to the final whistle. And, uh, and I think uh, Hudson Card's going to be okay uh, for for a while at quarterback for Texas. Well, one one team that's looking really good in the SEC so far is Arkansas. How far do you see uh, Sam Pittman taking this team? I think uh, sky's the limit for for Coach Pittman. Big big man is uh, he's one heck of a football coach and has put together a pretty good program in a short period of time. Um, when you look at KJ Jefferson, they've got the piece of quarterback. Uh, I like what Kendall Bryles is doing as their offensive coordinator, kind of opening things up and fitting the talent that's within the program. So uh, I think the sky's the limit for Arkansas. You certainly can't take them lightly, and they've proven it uh, the last couple of years. Hey, Dre, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us here on Up to the Second College Football. Let's do it again. Guys, anytime. Just give me a ring, and uh, and I'm, I'm at your disposal. Thanks a bunch. At Academy Sports and Outdoors, bikes for the whole family are just a click away. Buy online at academy.com with our free in-store assembly. Your next set of wheels plus helmets, pads, and water bottles will be waiting for you at our in-store pickup counter. Get to the fun faster with our in-store pickup and free assembly at Academy Sports and Outdoors. Now it's time for our big game of the week, and it should have been a bigger game, I'm just saying. Miami versus Texas A&M. We're going to look at both perspectives from the Miami perspective. Alex Dino, Locked on Canes, joining us. And uh, my guy, Billy Lucci, Texags, of course, boss, good friend here with us to give us the A&M perspective. Gentlemen, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. How are you guys? Well, doing pretty good because I'm I'm actually excited about it. You feel much better having the Miami freaking hurricanes coming to Kyle Field Saturday than than playing some uh no name non conference team because there there'd be nothing to look forward to after after Saturday in App State. And I know you guys you covered a game a year ago where App State almost got Miami and and last weekend A and M, you know, they at the, the Mountaineers the finished the job. Yeah, they did. Alex, let, let's get things started off with you, Southern Miss. So what happened in that game? Because it, it looked a little rocky early on, and then Miami was able to turn it on in the second half. Yeah, there was a lot of sleepwalking going on both sides of the football in the first half, specifically on, on the offensive side, because it really only took a couple of possessions for the defense to start adjusting. But uh, Tyler Van Dyke, I thought, uh, had his worst first half 
since his very poor first half against Florida State last year. Passing game looked completely out of sync, and it didn't really offer any opportunities to keep the running game in rhythm. Um, I think they had one heck of a halftime chat on both sides of the football because uh, the defense uh, looked a lot more disruptive and started producing tackles for loss and sacks in the second half. They pitched a second half shutout. And the offense actually started following through on drives. And, you know, it wasn't even as much about Tyler, although, you know, Miami did have a huge play in the passing game in the second half, a flea flicker touchdown for a long play from Tyler Van Dyke to Keyshawn Smith. But really the running game picked up. And, and that's been the focal point, guys. The first couple of games, and, you know, Miami has played inferior opposition the first couple of games. Southern Miss last week, Bethune Cookman the week prior. They've kept things very vanilla, like very vanilla on offense. And it kind of has people wondering just how much are they going to open up from this Texas A&M game on forward? Because, you know, for as good of, uh, of an offensive coordinator as Josh Gaddis is, uh, people kind of look at what he did at Michigan last year, and it was a very run-heavy offense. So people wonder just how much more exciting is the offense going to get. Uh, personally, you know, I, I saw them in fall camp working on a lot of RPO, and they haven't really brought that out at all in the first two games. So I think it's gonna, I think it's gonna open up a lot more. But the big thing from a Miami side of things is. Uh, and, you know, I, I see a lot of Hurricanes fans chirping now after seeing Texas A&M lose to Appalachian State. I think that makes the game even tougher, quite frankly. I think the fact that they just lost to Appalachian State only makes the Aggies angrier. I think Miami's going to have to start fast and they're going to have to score some points in the first half. All right, Billy, I hope the answer is no to this, but do we know who the real A&M team is yet? No, I don't think so. But 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 also what we don't know is is – what this team's ceiling is, and I, I didn't I, – I, I would have thought you'd be saying that after two games, yeah. What I wouldn't think we would be saying is that the floor is what it was and, and, and hopefully does not continue to be, but could be for another couple weeks. I, I Do I think this team will get a lot better? Yes. Um, but the problem is the schedule. And here comes Miami. And, and, and like you said – they haven't been tested. You have no idea how good Miami is. This could be a four-loss Miami team coming in here. This could be a, a ten and two type of Miami team coming in here that go, goes and wins a bowl and goes eleven and two. A and M doesn't know what they're getting. Miami, I, I, I hope they think they know what they're getting because if they think they're going to get that, a and I think Crystal Ball will have them much more mentally prepared than that. This is going to be a back in the corner. A and M team, but we the the real question mark is, what are we going to see at quarterback this weekend? Does Jimbo continue to go with Haynes? Does he make the move to Max Johnson? Does he start Haynes with a short leash, or does he go in with a plan to play both? That's not typically been Jimbo's mo, but he's done it uh, in his career. So I think that that and and. What does a backed into the corner A and M team look like? Make this this team, I think, the biggest wild card in college football this weekend, because we know what the players they've got. We've seen the, some of the guys produce. We don't even know what's going to happen at quarterback. But then you throw in a Miami team that I think would rate pretty high up on the wild card list as well. So I'm I'm fascinated by this matchup and agree with what you with what you just said. That first quarter or so, I think determines. You know, is it? I, I'm expecting a 60 minute fight, fist fight here. I think it, it's decided on the first, you know, two or three possessions for each team. Alex, help me understand Tyler Van Dyke because he's a guy that's got all the intangibles, has really good numbers, gets a lot of hype. He hasn't taken on, I think, a defense the caliber of what I think A&M's defense is going to be. What kind of quarterback is Tyler Van Dyke when the defenses do ramp up? Well, I, I think the first thing about Van Dyke, and obviously I have to look back to last season because they haven't faced true competition yet this year. Uh, he seems to have the type of mental fortitude where he he actually tends to raise his level based on the level of competition, which was obviously a very nice thing to see last season. Although he didn't, you know, he he never uh, started against an SEC team because he didn't start against Alabama first game of the year. So this is going to be probably a bigger test than anything he faced last season. But he does seem to actually enjoy being booed. He literally said that today. So he's going to be enjoying a lot of things on Saturday if he <laughs> enjoys being booed because he's going to get booed a lot. 
And uh, listen, he's he's got a big arm. Uh, I think the only the only thing that's you know let him down on a few occasions, and when you're going up against teams like Southern Miss and Bethune Cookman, you have to be very nitpicky about it. Yeah, uh, he's he's made a couple of poor decisions, but you still see him making NFL caliber throws, and uh, and he's taken on more of a leadership role this year. So he he's got the mental makeup where I really don't worry about Tyler Van Dyke heading into this game. I think if anything you kind of worry about more receivers stepping up because the Miami's really had one guy who stepped up consistently this year. And that's Xavier Restrepo, who's been his top target. But then if Texas A&M wants to take one guy out of the game, I think that they can, and then it's going to take other receivers and tight ends to beat A&M. So I think that's going to be the question is who's going to step up in the receiving game. All right, Billy. So we've talked quarterback though. What changes though, other changes could we see offensively? I mean, is it personnel? Is it uh, how they attack uh, Miami? What, what, could look different well I think they have to attack Miami different I don't think that's an, an option the attack plan has not it certainly didn't work on Saturday I think a little more commitment to the ground game first of all is, is an absolute must um, and maybe getting Bryce Foster back will help he did return to practice yesterday the, the center mm-hmm. that they've been without for the first two games and, and it's it showed there's no question about it I just wonder how far along Bryce can be with the lack of practice time. But if he can be out there, I do think that's, that's, about, that's about it in terms of personnel. I don't think there's necessarily a need personnel-wise. Maybe you see them go a little heavier tight end if, if they think that'll help with, uh, on the blocking front. But that's about it. And I think uh, defensively, it's as simple as getting certain guys back. And I do think they'll have McKinley Jackson, who's their best interior defensive lineman. I think with, with the true freshman – Still coming on, I think that's by a long shot. He's a difference maker when he's healthy. And then uh, I think you'll see cornerback Jalen Jones back out there for the first time this year. So they need those those veterans back, and they and I think they need that just from a standpoint of – I noticed it against App State. A lot of confusion on defense, and a lot of guys kind of – you know, falling for the, you know, the, the action of the play and, and leaving things wide open on the backside and things like that that the more, more veterans you get out there, the less of that you're going to see. All right, Alex, let's, let's go through both scenarios. What does a win mean for Miami moving forward, and what would a loss do to them moving forward? Yeah, I, I think a win uh, would be just absolutely massive because there's just so many expectations now for the football program with Cristobal, the staff he's bringing in, even the front office staff. I mean, they – took the athletic director, Dan Radakovich, from Clemson. We know what his ambitions were there and what he wants to accomplish at Miami. So, um, yeah, a victory against a program like Texas A&M this early in the process for Miami would really kind of give people a sign that they're progressing even more quickly than people had hoped. And then uh, a loss, I I want to, you know, for for anybody – watching this who's looking at it from a Miami perspective if Miami loses this game like don't don't freak out too much because I think again some people from a Miami side are maybe overreacting a little bit to Texas A&M losing to Appalachian State and talking about how much more pressure is on Miami to win I don't think any of that's changed like I I look at this game the same way today as I did preseason even if I had assumed Texas A&M would be 2-0 heading into this game I think it's just as difficult uh, as I thought it was going to be a couple of weeks ago so I mean you know if you lose this game you hope it's competitive that's number one you don't want to get blown out ever because that used to happen to Miami a lot when they'd face the SEC so keep it competitive win or lose you have your whole ACC schedule in front of you so I hope people don't overreact to a loss if that transpires all right Billy I'm gonna ask you the same exact question yeah what does a win mean and yeah. what does a loss mean I think a win is it, it doesn't completely erase App State but it gives you it, it's a huge step towards doing so and I, I think it also sets you up to be able to completely erase it. I, I look, if they can win, they don't have to me they don't have a chance to beat Arkansas if they don't beat Miami. They've got to have that menta- that that boost going in. But these next two games, if Texas A&M figures it out, uh I I really believe the App State loss is washed. And 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 so you have an opportunity there, but the other thing is in Mario Cristobal year 1 game 2. And I'm not I'm I'm not saying look, Texas A&M almost beat Dabo and Clemson the year they won the national title in game two. It came down to a two-point conversion. You can be good in game two under a new coach, especially in today's college football. But with what A&M's built and what, what we're being told has been built, 
in year five at home against Miami, and you got a home and home with them, uh, you need to win the home game when it's game three. I say game two, game three of a new coach at Kyle Field at night. You know, it, it you're you're being handed every advantage in this thing, and when you go back to back with these guys, you you better win this one. So there's that, a loss, David, and, and you're you're right now today. I think Arkansas is a tougher game. I think Mississippi State in Starkville with Will Rogers, a tougher game. That matchup has never really favored A&M, and they've got such a – I think Mississippi State has the best defense of the next three teams a and is going to play, maybe even four. I, Bama's, I'm still skeptical of Bama's defense, believe it or not. Mark that down as the season progresses. But – if you don't win this one at home at night, coming off that loss, and I'm, it is far from a guarantee. This is going to—I think it's going to be a flip a coin game. But if you don't pull it off, you are you are looking at a very real possibility of a one in five start, and it's not guaranteed. But that definitely comes into play. Uh, it, this is a—I think this is the swing game in the season, and I think I'd put it up there with Florida in 2020 as kind of a pivotal point. Uh, for the program and, and Jimbo because they are, they shut up a lot of skeptics that day uh, and they'll have a chance to do that this Saturday night. Alex and Billy, we appreciate it. Thanks so much, guys. All right. Thank you. Thanks. All right. I've got here with me Dean Leggy from dogpost.com and we are going to be talking about the Georgia-South Carolina matchup this weekend. Dean, how you doing? Good. I'm here. How are you? I'm doing good too. I'm ready to get talking about these teams now. Georgia seems like they're picking up right where they left off last year. I mean, two games under their belt, looking great. What are you seeing so far? What are you liking from this team? Well, they scored a bunch of points the first game. Uh, they didn't score as much in the second, which was against an FCS opponent. Uh, they've been better on defense, I think, than a lot of folks suspected they would be. But um, offensively, uh, certainly in the first game, that was just really impressive how well they played uh, against Oregon. Yeah, they really seem to appear capable of defending their national championship title. Is that kind of what the sentiment is like there in Athens? Well, um, not from inside the program necessarily. They're 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 doing their um, usual uh, sandbagging, but um, I think folks have picked up that um, Georgia is in a pretty good position heading into um, the first game of the conference. And um, I mean, I was telling folks over the summer that it wouldn't be shocking if they won the national championship. It would be surprising because any time you win the national championship, that's not an easy thing to accomplish. But it did look like they had the guys that you needed to perform at a high level. Um, and so far this season, um, they've looked pretty good. And part of it, too, as you know, Kennedy, is when you've got teams who have had a hard time like Ohio State and Alabama, who are considered, you know, formidable op opponents for the dogs, that that makes it look like Georgia's further along, perhaps, than they really are. Yeah, and if that team was able to accomplish that after losing so many great players to the draft last year, I think that'd be pretty historic. So, first yeah. matchup of the SEC this weekend against South Carolina. How do these two teams match up? Oh, not well for South Carolina, unfortunately for them. Um, this, I mean. I thought Carolina played pretty well against Arkansas in the middle part of the game. Um, but, you know, in, in the eight quarters of football, South Carolina has really not played great in that time. Uh, Georgia State was beating them in the third quarter. Uh, Georgia State is not a great team. North Carolina beat them pretty solidly in two, in, a week ago. They had to use two block punts to get uh, going for touchdowns. South Carolina did that. That's a pretty amazing accomplishment, actually. Um, but, uh, you know, Georgia has – played South Carolina for decades. Then they came into the league. When they got into the league, the game became more difficult for Georgia. South Carolina and Columbia has become much more of a known as a snake pit for Georgia. Hard to get out of there with wins. But they, they're 10 and 5 in uh, 15 games in Columbia over the last 30 years. So Georgia usually expects a tough fight when they go to Columbia, but they haven't lost there since 2014. Yeah, and they – Georgia had a great on the road record last season. So I feel like that's no real struggle for them. So after seeing what Arkansas did to this team last week, are Coach Smart and this offense really just chomping at the bit to run through this South Carolina defense? 
So run is the the number one word there. Um, you know, Georgia has been a bit spotty with the run. They've been very effective with certain players, but they were not great in the red zone last week. That's not all, that's not all against the run. Um, but Kendall Milton, who is the who has been the number two running back, he's starting to sp- pick up steam. Uh, he's going for eight and a half yards a carry a week ago. South Carolina really, really struggles stopping the run, giving up 250 uh, yards a game. That is just not – that's not going to work. Now, Georgia's not like they were a year ago, and they're not like they were um, with Nick Chubb and Sony Michelle and guys like that. They're much more predicated on the, the pass. But I wouldn't want to say I have to stop Georgia um, – Georgia's run game because the offensive line is very good. And um, I think it's not a great matchup for Carolina. So what kind of challenges do you think Spencer Rattler poses for this Bulldog defense? Well, he's got to play discipline. I mean, you saw him at OU and he was kind of up and down there at Carolina. He's been fine so far. He can really throw. He can really run. He, he has the capability of being really good, but he needs help. And he also needs to not make mistakes. Um, it's not easy playing quarterback in this league. And for Spencer Rattler, um, playing Arkansas and Georgia back-to-back, that's about as physical as, as it's going to get. But um, it, it's just tough when you don't, you know, when you don't have a lot of time. It's hard in athletics when you don't have space and time. You don't have space and time stuff gets really tough. And I think that's going to be a challenge for him this weekend. Yeah, this is the SEC. There's no room for mistakes around here. So Kirby Smart said that this game against Samford really wasn't a good measuring stick for them and that Mm -hmm. he thinks that his team needs to improve in every facet of the game. So has that kind of been the message and vibe around there this week? Well, it's Kirby Smart. So this is what he's going to do. He's not wrong. But he he usually does this after Georgia plays teams that are not uh, on kind of on their level, for lack of a better term. I mean, it wasn't a league game. He's acknowledging in a in a off uh, in an offhand way that they didn't do some things as well as they would have liked. Uh, but they were up thirty to nothing um, at the half, and um, they just weren't as crisp as maybe they usually are. The things they need to improve on, I think defensively, it's hard to say they've got a ton. They've allowed three points in two games. Um, on the offensive side of the ball, there were touch there, touchdowns there to be had, and they just didn't score them. I think it's just as simple as, you know, score touchdowns, uh, don't kick field goals, and there wouldn't be a lot to complain about. But it, it wouldn't be Kirby Smart without the um, the needling of his team. Right. Well, great stuff. Thanks so much for joining us. That was Dean Leggy with dogpost.com. Need a new grill? Academy Sports and Outdoors is the destination for your outdoor cooking needs. With our free in-store assembly and pre-assembled grills and smokers, buy online at academy.com and pick up in-store. So keep those grilling plants at Academy Sports and Outdoors. Rolling on through here on Up to the Second College Football. we got a rematch between an SEC team and a Big Teen team from last year. It was a good one when we talk about Auburn and Penn State. we got Zach Blackerby from Locked on Auburn with us to uh, break it all down. Zach, what's going on, man? Man, I- I'm just so glad that-, that college football is back. I'm sure you are too, brother. Uh, I don't know. After my last week, I don't know. I don't know. No, I'm kidding. Uh, let's let's get it. <laughs> for those who don't know, obviously the A&M game was not fun for me. Let's talk about right. the, this Auburn team. Two games in, uh, I, I know that we're going to learn a lot more about them, but are they potentially better than what we thought they'd be, or uh, we're still going to have to figure it out? I think it's impossible to know. I mean, I, I think a lot of Auburn folks may feel a little bit more optimistic if they would have blown out San Jose State last week. Obviously, that didn't happen. They actually had to come back, which I, I would not have predicted going into it. Running the ball, I think, is an issue, which is kind of what needs to be the strength of this team with all the questions of quarterback, whether it's it appears it's TJ Finley, and then Robbie Ashford kind of having that rotational role. Um but, man, until they do it against a good team and beat a good team, I think all the critics are still going to be pretty kind of – I think they're going to be hard on Harson. Is Zach Calzada not even in the picture right now? Is he still coming back from injury? Is he just running with the threes? What's, what's the story with him? Uh, I think he just kind of got passed up, yeah. and it was an open competition between 
Calzada, Finley, and Ashford, and Calzada hasn't taken a snap yet. I, I think that was all just kind of competition, and look, it sounds like he put in the work, but with what I saw throughout fall camp, he was the worst of the three consistently. And he, of course, had his days and impressed, you know, with some of the drills and things like that. But every report we heard, he was consistently the third guy uh, in, in scrimmages and the third guy that kind of participated in drills. And he never really changed any of that. So uh, give me your evaluation of both quarterbacks who have played. They've had some hits. They've had some misses. Yeah. So Robbie Ashford, I think, is, is a spark. And it's been interesting to see how this coaching staff has used him. Very, very dynamic. Essentially, when he's in, it's a wildcat because I don't think the coaching staff really trusts him to throw the football. I think they gave him the, the chance to really take the keys and win the starting job. And he didn't do it against San Jose State. He threw an interception. And they didn't really trust him to throw it after that. TJ Finley threw his third pick of the season. He threw two against Mercer, threw one against San Jose State last week. But after that, he had his best performance as an Auburn Tiger, I, I believe. And he is that a sign of things to come? Was it just Auburn's players being bigger, better, faster, stronger than San Jose State over the course of a game? And so they wore him down. I think time will tell, but he's got an arm. It's just, can he put it all together? And to, to me, he hasn't done that yet. So what about the receivers? Because I, I looked at the numbers. They didn't get going until what, midway through the second quarter, something like that? Yeah, yeah, there was, was so much talk about the wide receivers. You know, they brought in Coy Moore from LSU. Cheswick Jackson's coming back for his 20th year on the Plains, it feels like. And it, it really kind of felt like there was some positive momentum with them hiring, you know, former NFL guy Ike Killier to come and lead that room from a coaching standpoint. And I don't think Auburn has 10 wide receiver receptions on the season so far, which is crazy. They throw it to the running backs, they throw it to the tight ends, but... I don't know if it's a scheme thing. I don't know if they just feel like wide receivers can't get open. I don't know if the quarterbacks aren't trusting them. But there's just been so much focus on the running game and getting Robbie Ashford touches in this wildcat type role that, yeah, there's only so many plays that you get on offense. And receivers aren't really getting a whole lot of a chance. Zach, remind the audience, give us like a little history lesson of last season of this matchup, how wire to wire it went and, and what it could mean for an Auburn victory. Yeah, I think a lot of fans were very frustrated with how this one ended. Tank Bigsby was running the ball at will. And then when it came down to it, the most important drive of the game, the last one, Auburn's down eight. They need to drive the length of the field to get there. No Tank Bigsby. It was all Jarquez Hunter. But still, if they got to where they could score, they were just outside of the end zone. It was a fourth and two, I believe, from like the five or the six. And Bo Nix throws a fade, misses Kobe Hudson, went on the opposite side of the formation. Demetrius Robertson was wide open on a slant. So a lot of frustration afterwards in the locker room, it sounds like. A lot of frustration uh, throughout the fan base. And I think that was really Brian Harson's first moment of like, um, oh, it's different here in the SEC. Because he was asked a million times, you know, why the fade? Why the fade in post, in, in post game? And it was a very coach speak answer. We got to go back and watch tape. We got to go back and watch tape, which is fine. And then that following Tuesday, when he met with the media, the first question was, okay, you watch tape. What about the fade? Why'd you call that? And you could see in his eyes, like, oh, y'all are still talking about that. So I, I think that was a very monumental game for Brian Harson and his tenure at Auburn. We'll see, um, we'll see if he treats it a little bit differently this year. Zach, I appreciate it, man. Let's do it again, all right? All right, sounds good, man. All right, Zach Black review locked on Auburn. That'll do it for up to the second college football. We'll see you guys next week with episode four.